I'm Stefan Belma, and welcome to another podcast. In this podcast, I discuss with one of my students the theories of Ruskin. Ruskin was a famous writer at the turn of the century and was responsible for the arts and crafts movement. We discuss horizons, how we establish it, and where we put an horizon on our pain. We also talk about ego and performance anxiety. To sit back and relax and enjoy this conversation I have with one of my students. I, I have a huge workload, but it's it's uh, it's fun and exciting. I you know I have my birthday, which was like awesome. I mean, I have I was so lucky and fortunate to do what I'm doing. Um, you know, to to have birthday wishes from thousands of people. I mean. Uh, a lot of that Facebook stuff is because of my TV show, but a lot of people have the Facebook group where people just wish you a happy birthday. But yeah, my happy birthdays aren't just the Facebook. Oh, yeah, happy birthday! Punch this button and off you go. I get these paragraphs from people. Yeah, happy birthday! I just wanted to reach out. I saw it was your birthday. I watch your videos all the time. Oh my God, you've changed my life. You know. I divorced my husband and went off into a different career or whatever. I mean, just these stories that just go on and on and on. Hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And then I go into my classrooms where people I haven't seen for years show up on my birthday. And and, uh, it's like, wow, you know, know? they like me. They really like me. I feel like (laughs) I've done that a couple of times where, you know, I got the People's Choice Award at in Klamath at the museum there. And I was trying not to be a braggart because people don't like it when you brag. But I was like, uh, when you get the People's Choice, it's like, it, it's not like, oh, well, a peer says, yes, you're, this is a good painting. It's like everybody likes it. You go, wow, people like it. They really like it. It's not just an artistic thing. But then you sit there, the next thing is, see, I suffer from the same thing everybody else does. It's like, so why did the people choose this one over all the other great paintings that were there? Yeah. Yeah. And then I go, well, it's probably a guy painting. And so you have all this. And so I came up with all kinds of excuses. So, you know, no matter how how good you are, how bad you are, doesn't matter who points at you and says, I, I adorn you with a gift of, of first place or people's choice, your ego still comes in and goes, oh, that can't be true. That can't be true. I yeah. remember my mom said to me when I was four that I'd never make anything of myself if, a, if I was going to be an artist. So there's something wrong here because I'm making it. I took lots of courses to try to figure out. But the thing is, the problem is, is that you don't think wrong with you. I mean, I, I remember when somebody says, oh, take this course. And I said, no, there's nothing wrong with me. And they go, no, you need to take this course. And so I did. And I was like sitting there in the back of the room, 250 people in this in this auditorium. And I'm sitting in the back. I got my headphones on. I'm, I'm got a book in front of my face. And I say, here, transform this. But boy, when you all of a sudden are, are realizing that you're standing in shit. Um, and I think that's part of the coaching thing, too, is that you don't know what you don't know. And you're sitting there and you're just sitting there. You know, there's just there's nowhere to go except with the few little tools that you have. You need somebody to, to, to knock you over the head and say, here, look at this. Look at this. Oh, what about this? And see how that fits with this. And you go, yeah. wow. I handed you the series of books and I said... Now, this is a tough read. You have never read anything this hard. And it is, and you you opened it up, you read a paragraph and you went like, wow, 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 what insight. Wow, that's really great. I I need to read these. Welcome welcome to Ruskin. That's, that's, it's like reading the Bible. I don't, I've never read the Bible myself. I just, you know, I see people, they, they sit there and they hold that book and they, they read it, read it, read it, read it. I'm going, what are you reading? I mean, there's a reason why the Catholics said, don't read the Bible. <laughs> you know, it's like, because, because it doesn't make sense. So they take out a chat, you know, a paragraph. And uh, so it's John verse one, line one, or however they, they do all that. Um, so I should do that with Ruskin. And I actually was thinking about doing some blogs on Ruskin and go chapter by chapter and take it apart 
Because even if you take apart a chapter, you have to take apart the page. It's not just a chapter because somewhere in three or four paragraphs, there's just one point. And there are, there are books, there are books that are, you know, some people who just try to decipher that because he really was instrumental in creating the crafts movement. And so there were people based on this philosophy that went off and forded communes. Woodstock was an art community. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a Ruskin, um, a group of people that came together and said, oh, let's make crafts. And so that's basically what was the, the, the history of that area. It is really deep. So what did Ruskin have to say about water? Well, you know, I kind of, when I teach water, I kind of do that kind of thing. So it's like vertical, vertical, vertical. So I, I say you paint water vertical, you know, and so a lot of, a lot of people are just stunned by us. When you watch Bob Ross, he, he'll take that big, huge house brush and go up and down, up and down, up and down. And then he takes his palette knife and he goes ripple, 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 horizontal. It's a combination of the vertical for the reflection and then horizontal lines to create, to make it look flat. Even though a true reflection is all vertical, I never want that anyway. And you want to always make sure that when people are doing reflections i just want to puke it's like first thing it is when you when people bring in pictures and they go oh i want to do a perfect reflection absolutely perfect i want to have all of these fall trees reflected in the water wouldn't that be grand and i go it's absolutely boring because it's the same picture repeated twice and so in a painting it's like ah yeah. Even when you see the water lilies from from um, Monet, like Monet. Yeah, yeah, Monet's water lilies, you'll yeah. look down and you see the reflection. Yeah. But you won't see the, you'll see the sky reflecting in the water lilies, but you don't see the sky. You know, it's either one or the other. And when we think about our, our perception, our depth or something, we usually look across at something. So we look at a forest. So we, you know, across the lake, we look at the forest and our eyes are up there. For us to look at the reflection, we have to look down. And this is where most people fail in painting is that they don't know where the horizon is. Because like with Monet, when we look down, we see the reflection and we see whatever that is, but we can't see the, the, the trees or the sky because we have to move our head. So, yeah. so having the horizon line looking down, remember when we did a workshop and I had the 12 keys Yeah. and remember one of the keys is her uh, horizon line and people go, right. well, that's just where the sky meets the, the, the earth. And it's like, no, there's definitely uh, uh, a horizon line is where your eye level is, you know, and it's usually in the center of the painting somewhere. <laughs> People, people always think, well, you put the horizon line in one of the thirds, you know, but literally the horizon line is always somewhere in the middle because that's how we see. If I come up and greet you, I'm not sitting there putting your body into one of the thirds. And even when you take a picture of something, your mother told you, oh, never put the little crosshairs in the middle of your, your lens. Back in the olden days when we used to have crosshairs and lenses and good cameras, you always make sure that you move the crosshairs to the left or to the right of the object because you don't want to have anything dead center. But that's the way we see, though. Automatically, when we pick up a camera, we put it dead center. So that's our horizon line. When we look down, our horizon line now is skewed you know, because now the center is down there. So when we look at a Monet painting, we see the water lilies and our eyes are positioned to something in that painting that is horizontal that we put in the dead center. So if we're looking at uh, lily pads, our, our, our eyes are facing down, our horizon line is actually now lower. And it doesn't matter what's going up because now we're looking lower. And then we have lily pads. So you imagine if you're gonna take a picture of lily pads, you would have one in the center. So you'd remember what your mom said, move the lily pad to the left or to the right. Um, so uh, the horizon line means everything. So when you're doing a reflection, 
you you can't see the reflection and the trees at the same time in real life now you try to crunch that into your painting and it's a double double um double painting the same painting painting twice and what i think is kind of interesting is that this series is called the modern painter yeah it's five it's five volume and, and the thing is i have dyslexia and add so like it's even worse for me because i sit there and like you said you go through a lot of words and the thing is it's older english you know like when you read carlson's guide to landscape painting that was done in the 30s and 40s, somewhere around there. There's a different way that people spoke and wrote things. And I believe he's also from from England. So there's that little oddity of you know the language barrier because we don't speak English. We speak American now. You know, so we don't quite get that same that same English thing going on. They have that flair, that gilded age kind of thing. Oh, but I love it though, you know. Um, I do too. Uh, I love. Outfits. Yeah, I know. That's why we dress the way we do. Um, uh, but uh, the outfits were awesome. But you know, like Oscar Wilde. Oh my God, is there anything more beautiful than his? But his is the same way. You know, Oscar Wilde's so clever that he, he, you'll sit there and go, "Oh, I got it," and then he'll he'll like mock you and go, "No, you didn't." listen to it yeah. do it again now ran it through again and now you got it and you go oh i got it now you know it's 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 their their wordsmiths are very careful with what how they spoke there's so much that gets piled on to the whole art education and we lose sight that it's not about the end product and we go out and paint somewhere and we, we work hard to try to, to get all the rules in and get this and that and make, it, make this so that we have an end product that we can go home and show our spouses and go, look, honey, look what I did at the workshop. Can I go again? Because these paintings are so awesome. You know? Right. And so you sit there and you, you mull over everything. Like this weekend, you're going you know, to come home with, with uh, the painting that you do on Sunday morning that you got up early and did. And, uh, you, you know, you, you're going to be very concerned that she's going to go, hey, you got up this morning. We didn't make love. We didn't have breakfast together. You went out and chose to paint, and this is what you did? Yeah. <laughs> you know? That ego thing is like, you know, you feel like you have to perform. It's performance anxiety. Yeah. Performance anxiety. How do we get rid of performance anxiety? And you know, when it comes to other performances, once you dwell on the performance society, especially as men, women can fake it, but men have, you know, obviously, when you have that part of the conversation, all of a sudden it's really hard to perform. Yes. And our egos step in and then it becomes worse. It becomes a spiral. It's like, oh my God, I've lost my manhood. I don't know how to, I don't know how to paint. I'm, I'm, I'm fading fast. It's like, oh yeah. shit, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we have that in us. So the same thing with painting, though. You you show up with, with uh, you know, all this, and then, you know, your wife's going to be sitting there. And so, you, you know, and you've got a lot writing on stuff. So it's like, oh my God, if you just fuck up. So what are, what would it be like if you just had no, no um, accountability? Yeah. You didn't share it with anybody. You know, the problem, too, is that you have me now. Yeah, but see, you can't be that. That's performance anxiety right there. Yeah. I mean, you shouldn't care. Yeah. See, see, when we practice, when well, you've never played an instrument, did you? No, unfortunately not. No. Yeah, so, so like, you know, I played uh, a piano and accordion and different instruments. But you'll spend an hour. If you want to be a concert pianist, you have to spend six hours a day practicing and at the end of that time you close the piano and walk off and have dinner there's no record of it there's no it just disappears and you're hoping after a period of a month or two all of this hidden practice uh makes sense but you're going to make all kinds of mistakes and you're going to have the same frustration when you're doing anything you watch uh writers 
writers sit and they go through paper. You know, the old fashioned kind, they'd always be, ah, you know, and they tear up the paper and then they do it again. Yeah, now we have word processors. So now we no longer have a trash can full of, you know, aha, you can't do it, you can't do it. We edit, edit, edit as we go. There's still the same artist block that you go through. It's just that it's, it's, we delete it. So there's no evidence of it. The problem is with painting, there's evidence. It's like a crime scene and you, and you, you've just slaughtered something. And now, you know, the hardest thing for a murderer to do is to get rid of the body. The murder part is easy. It's the disposal of the body and cleaning up the mess. Well, guess what? When you go outdoors, I've never thought of this, but when you go outdoors and do plain air painting, it is like a crime scene. You know, it's like, oh, shit. And the thing is, you know, you, you need to hide the evidence. Um, and the problem is, is that we have our spouses going, well, you didn't spend time with me. What did you do all day? You know, and then yeah. they, they accuse you of having an affair. It's like, well, you didn't do any painting. It's like, yeah. So you figure, well, I, if I'm going to do anything, I, I you better. I can't just drive around looking for a place because otherwise she'll think or he'll think that I'm having an affair somewhere. So I'm going to have to come home with something. You know, and it better be full and big and, and good because, you know, it was like, well, you did that on the way home. So, I mean, if you could actually like go out there and paint and not have the responsibility to show anybody, including me. You could say, yeah, you know, I painted. But I'm not going to show you because it's just my thing. I did practice. Leonardo da Vinci thought that painting was the true art form because it didn't require you to learn anything to read it, you know, like poetry and, and, and writing. Um, it, it, it is a record of the moment, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. that's the problem. It kind of should come from your, your soul, you know, like music does. Um, and he said that music wasn't the, you know, the, the highest form because music's the only one that's fleeting. Is how once it was, once it was played, it was gone. But nowadays we have CD players and MP3 players and stuff, so it's a little different now. But there's still the the hours and hours. I mean, I probably can't tell you how many times I played Claire, Claire de Lune so perfectly, and there was no oh. record of it. It's so fleeting because once it's yeah. played, it's gone. And you know that that whole awesome so it's it's like this creating of art in a moment and that's what i request of you is to go out and create claire de Lune. so there you have it everything you need to know about painting discussed in one little simple podcast i don't think so if you'd like to get some more information about my upcoming podcast you could do so at my website at www.stephanbauman.com there you could find information about workshops and register for a free book on everything I know about painting. If you'd like to get more information about my coaching, just go ahead and give me a call at 415-606-9074. Until our next podcast, remember, paint with passion.